Hey everybody, I'm Chris Vaccaro and this is another Sachem Conversation and I'm joined by the legendary Sachem wrestling coach, Jack Mahoney. We're going to talk about his life and career and impact on this community. As I've said before, the purpose of this project is to have an oral history from the people who lived it and made the history here uh, for the sake of the educational and co-curricular advancement of thousands of kids uh, who have experienced what Sachem is. And I'm excited to talk to Coach about his life, career, and impact. And thanks for coming on today. Hey, thanks for having me. This is great. So I always like to start in the beginning. I like to go back to, um, you know, when you were a kid and where you grew up. And, you know, everybody obviously thinks of you as a Sachem guy. And maybe many people think of you as a Lindenhurst guy because that's where you went to school and where you wrestled. But even before that, you know, you lived in New York City. And I only learned that a couple months ago from you. But talk about the initial phase of your life and the impact that had on you. Well, I was born in Manhattan. Um, then probably I was only about a year or so old. And we moved to a, 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 what's called the projects along the East River in Astoria. Um, we lived there until I was in sixth grade. I went to Catholic school in Astoria. Then we moved out to Lindenhurst. Um, I finished up at OLPH in Lindenhurst. So I was still going to Catholic school. So still no phys ed classes, no, no, well, we had community sports, little league football and stuff, but um, didn't really get into physical education classes and, and organized sports and, and school things until I was a ninth grader at Lindenhurst. What about wrestling? Was that something that, that started in the city or Lindenhurst? When did that start to take shape in your life? When, when we lived in Astoria, they opened up the Boys Club of Queens and we went there for swimming, things like that, recreation. Somebody was trying to start a wrestling thing, it didn't catch on. So I knew the sport existed, but that was it. When I went to Lindenhurst, probably like most kids, uh, you follow your friends. And I guess I had uh, my closest friends were going out for the wrestling team. I had no idea what it entailed. I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know there were weight classes. I didn't know. I, I, I think the first wrestling match I ever saw was the first meet that my team went to. Um, so it was right, you know, started from scratch, knew nothing and built it from there. And was it, was it an instant love? Is it something that over the, throughout the process of going through wrestling that you fell in love with it? Talk about, you know, what struck you about it. And was that something you could see doing for the rest of your life? Well, it was a sport that every day uh, presented another challenge. I actually uh, was a, a real little chubby kid and um, uh, obviously was wrestling kids that were much bigger than me if they didn't have all the body fat on them that I did. Uh, wasn't real successful, but that drove me to want to work at it more and uh, just worked harder and, and tried to do the best I could. My, my high school career um wasn't very good um and then you know but i didn't give it up and i went on and continued it at suny brockport you know so uh it's just a, you know it's just something about wrestling it gets in your blood were you uh were you positively impacted by high school coaches did you see obviously you went into physical education and you know the, the whole world of staying in scholastic coaching and education and athletics the, the whole world was was you know uh at your fingertips based on something that you experienced at Lindenhurst and then of course at Brockport, who, who pushed you in that direction? Who were your mentors? Who inspired you to go into coaching and teaching? Um, I don't know if anybody in particular uh, did, but um, you know, just, you know, watching the whole atmosphere of what it was like at Lindenhurst high school and what it was like to be a phys ed teacher and, uh, and a coach, and, um, you know, them working with kids in general, not, not especially me, but just everybody, I, I was like, you know, that's something I think I want to do. And um, uh, even honestly, when I started at SUNY Brockport, I didn't start in the phys as a full phys ed major. I actually started as a math major. And then they, um, the state decided to split the health phys ed major and you could take one or the other. Uh, so I, I picked up the phys ed major. So I graduated Brockport with phys ed and math. And talk about Brockport, you know, what was the wrestling experience like there? 
How are your coaches? Did you improve a bit from your ability at Lindenhurst? Oh yeah, yeah, def definitely improved. Um, and I, I actually, um, the way my birthday fell, and I don't know, you know, what age they started yet at school in, in the city, um, but I, I was actually um, a junior in college, and I was still high school eligibility age. So you know, like where some parents hold their kids back, um, I was, you know. Um, I guess kind of pushed ahead, but um, I had uh, actually had a different coach at Brockport every year. It was one of those sports where they kind of like great gave it to grad assistants, and um, uh, but they were all great coaches, and they in inspired you to uh, keep you know keep working to get better, and, and you know the the I you know ended up being I guess an average wrestler, you know, placed in the SUNY conferences, stuff like that. But, um, you know, the, 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 but my feeling is if you're not that, you know, if you're not really that naturally talented, you have to work harder at it. You have to really study the sport and you have to learn all the ins and outs. And, um, and I think that's what, you know, gradually led me to be a better coach. Because I felt like I knew more about what was happening because I tried to learn more about what was happening to make up for the God-given talent that I didn't really have. And so you graduate college. It's time to get a job. Obviously, you know you want to be a coach. Where does Sachem come in? How did you land here? And what was your impression of Sachem pre-working here? Uh, you know, Was it something that was taking shape and taking form at that point? Well, I didn't have an impression of Sachem because I didn't even know where it was. Sachem, as you've heard from, you know, other coaches was a, a, a new community. So in the, my senior year of college was the 69, 70 uh, school year. Sachem actually sent recruits out to the state universities. If you were ambitious enough, you would go down um, and there, you'd meet with recruiters. They talk to you about the school district. They take your paperwork. Then I was invited to an interview. I went to what I didn't know was Seneca Middle School at the time, but it was in the Chippewa building. I met with Pete Creedon. Uh, he sent me to district office where I met with Don Fenner. He was in charge of personnel at the time. And I actually had not even student taught yet. And Sachem sent me a contract and invited me to be a teacher there the next year. And, um, and that was the start of it. I signed the contract, sent it in. And everybody's like, where's Sachem? I'm like, I don't know. I drove out on the expressway until the expressway ended. And then I got off, made a few turns, and there I was. Wow. Yeah, just the uh, trying to load up on staff with what I guess they, they figured out the right people. It all worked out in almost well, every angle, right? It, it was incredible. I always say that. Like, it, like, did Dave Rothenberg have a crystal ball? I mean, the coaching staff that he, well, stop, he hired, and of course it started with Don Woolley, who was there. Uh, ahead of all of us. Um, but he just, you know, he picked up, you know, all of these really great young guys. And, um, you know, and honestly, you know, I've said it a million times to anybody that will listen, we followed the leadership of Fred Fazzaro. He, he coached the coaches. He taught us how to be coaches, how to deal with kids, how to deal with parents, how to deal with administration. And, um, um, and he did a great job of it. And, you know, the, the whole, uh, you know, Sachem um, athletic umbrella um, had Fred Holden it over all of us. I'd love to pick Dave Rothenberg's brain. Obviously, that's impossible. Yeah, he's, impossible. he's long gone. But I wonder if he, I, I know that he and Walter Dunham must have realized, all right, here's Fred who coached at Hofstra and coached at St. Lawrence under Howdy Myers and some other legendary folks, you know, unknowing that they would be, I guess, legends. But he must, they must have realized, Hey, let's get this guy who's got a little bit of experience and then everybody else can build around that. I don't know if it was perfectly thought out that way, but it really worked out immensely and co combine that with the um, enrollment increasing people moving there in droves. And it just exploded, obviously, as you know, but here's you who uh, you get hired, you know, limited coaching, if any wrestling experience outside of uh, being an athlete yourself, you get a team. Sachem Wrestling had existed. It was just a team, but you quickly built a program. So are you looking at what Fred is doing as he's quickly building football or what Frank Schmidt is doing as he's building soccer? Like where are you able to put the pieces together to say, 
I'm going to be here for the long haul. I'm going to make this something. And how quickly did that happen? Well, it, it took a while. Like I say, our wrestling team, we didn't win a league one match until um, I think it was the last match of my third year of coaching. So um, we, we, we suffered a lot of losses, um, but, you know, we built on it. The, the early teams didn't even have a lot of, a lot of wrestlers on the team. And, um, but we just, um, I guess kids caught on. They, they thought they saw a program that they liked. Uh, and again, we took the, any advice that we could get and uh, just try to make it better and better. And the other real good thing about Sachem is that everybody shared their efforts. Like Fred saw a lot of merit in uh, his football players being wrestlers. And I think you already know that he was um, the freshman wrestling coach at, at Hofstra when he was there also. And, um, uh, you know, it, it just built and it got stronger and stronger. And then with the cooperation of Dave Rothenberg, the, the middle school programs got uh, stronger. Um, you know, Dave hired some people that we recommended. And, um, you know, Tim Cummins, um, Joe Remkes, you know, guys like that. And it just... Um, the Northern brothers, it, it got stronger and stronger and, and, you know, it, it grew to, uh, you know, what you, you know, saw, you know, in the final, um, the final result, you know, we, we had a, a, a good kid wrestling program too, that when we first got there, we had nothing. Then um, one of the middle school for the teachers and coaches called Kabasa. He, along with Marge and Bob Davis, Rick Fratraka, Bill Stark senior, they started first the Brookhaven Wrestling Club. They based it out of Sachem. Then they changed the name of it to the Sachem Three Star Wrestling Club. And, and that was it. They, they'd come in at night and start um, teaching kid, younger kids how to wrestle. And then they, would get, they were better when they were, got to middle school. And, um, and all those kids played other sports too. They were all soccer players, you know, youth football players. Um, it was just a really good blend. And it, it just kind of, you know, grew to get bigger and stronger. Was there a certain time period where you felt things were turning where, you know, you're, you're winning more and more dual meets, you're starting to place kids in the counties, you're winning state titles with kids. Was that late seventies, early eighties? Cause I feel like by the time all of our athletic program hit, hit programs hit the eighties, it was just full speed ahead. So I'm sure it took you, you know, five to 10 years to build. Right. Yeah. We, we, um, um, you know, we had all some all county wrestlers from the beginning, you know, like the first year, the second year, uh, you know, not a lot, but um, we didn't win a county championship, though, until the late 70s. And, um, uh, you know, then then we were getting stronger. Um, in 1981, they started a thing called the New York State Cup. They didn't have a dual me state championship, so they invited um, what were the best teams in the state. And if you accepted the invitation, you know, you, you, it was the state cup title. So you were considered the best dual meet team in the state. And actually the finals of that uh, were Sachem and Bayshore. So, um, uh, yeah, we were getting better, better. And, and in the eighties and early nineties were, were our really strongest years. And then, um, and, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of other schools copied, copied our image and, and they were, they were catching up. Yeah, I, you know, I think you look at the youth program, every major wrestling program on the island or the state has a great youth feeder system now. They all have built into using their successful alumni to come back to coach. They have the summer camps and clinics. Uh, and so I, I, I love the fact that we were the power, Sachin was the power that a lot of people used to model themselves after. And obviously that's a coup to, and a credit to you and your assistance over the years. Has wrestling changed at all from a tactical or a clinical perspective, or is it just a matter of how you build around a program is how you have success, or is it, you know is it completely different from when you started in the early seventies? Well, things are a little different now because um, just like uh, a lot of the other youth sports, now there there are more private clubs, there's more private tutoring, um, it's definitely more expensive. Where for a kid to be a kid wrestler, it was just like a nominal fee to, for a whole season. Now they're paying uh, tons of money to go to private clubs and, and things like that. But um, uh, other, other clubs have, have, you know, copied what we do. 
we were one of the first people on the island to have camps. You know, Syed was running their camps and uh, they didn't have a wrestling camp. So Skip Field and who was in charge of recreation at the time came to us and he was like, would you, would the Saves from Three Star Wrestling Club start a wrestling camp? And um, so we did. And then as far as, you know, other things, like at the time there was the Empire State Games, there was the, the junior nationals, the junior national teams. And I tried to host as many things at Sachem as Sachem would allow me to do to make it easier for the Sachem kids to be exposed to it. They'd see the sport. Um, they, they'd be exposed to a lot of the other good athletes on, on the island without really leaving home. And um, it was a lot of time and sacrifice for me and the family and everybody else, but it, it paid off in spades. It, it really was a home run. And the Empire State Games team, by the time our kids you know, knew a lot of about the sport, we were having five, six, seven guys a year on the team. And then the training camp would be at Sachem at night during the summer. And um, it was it was a it was a model that that you know a lot of good teams, successful teams, are copying now. You talk about the summer camp. I mean, for years and years, and you're still very much involved in it, which I think is a, another strong credit to your foundation in this community. You know, you could have given up and not been involved 20 years ago, yet you're still actively going to matches and meets and there for your. A, a former wrestlers that are now head coaches and there for the next generation and even the generation after that. But that summer camp, the amount of Olympians, former national champions, the highest level of wrestlers in the country have come to Sachem. And the average person may not understand or, or grasp the meaning of that. You know, you look at maybe a guy that's a professional baseball player or an NFL player. Cool. You get that because it's a top four type sport, but to be an Olympian in wrestling is arguably the highest level that you can achieve in that sport. And they're right there, right in the middle of Sage from North's gym, you know, tutoring and teaching. You've built these relationships. You've gotten a hold of these people. Can you talk about just the, the ability to get some of those big names and their impact on just tiny moments with kids that may live with them for the rest of their lives? Well, we, we try to tell kids that the, the people that we were bringing in would be like if, uh, the, if the baseball camp were in Derek Jeter. When we bring in an Olympic gold medalist, there really isn't anybody that was any better than that. We were fortunate to have friends um, that worked for uh, ASICS Tiger. ASICS was the, um, you know, Nike has Team USA now, but at the time, ASICS had USA Wrestling. So they would introduce us to Olympic gold medalists and started out with the first gold medalist. His name was Bob Weaver. He won the 1984 Olympics. And uh, I met him at Madison Square Garden. And they, um, we were actually online going into an Olympic wrestling meet. And then after that, I, I met more and more uh, medalists, you know, through Nick Allo and ASICS. And, and obviously having Isaac Ramaswamy on the staff later on uh, helped out too, because he was a member of Team USA. So a lot of the people that were really kind of regulars coming back every year also were, were friends with Isaac they stayed with them when they came here. And, uh, you know, it was just a, a, a really good situation that we had going. And, and they loved coming here. So, you know, they, um, you know, pe and people don't realize some of the people who came in, like, um, you know, Dave Schultz, who was an Olympic gold medalist in 84, and he's the subject of the movie Foxcatcher. Um, uh, you know, he came into it. Uh, for a day. And um, it was it was just great. I hope uh, the, ki the kids appreciated it and realized, you know, uh, what we did, you know, offer them. You mentioned Isaac Ramaswamy, who I had as a teacher and respect immensely. He's a Suffolk Hall of Famer, a Sachem Hall of Famer. Guys like that are alumni who wind up making careers out of education and coaching. And there's a ton of them. Sean O'Hara, Ray Pickerskill, and Swami come to mind because they're more modern era. And I know all of them. There's others too at, at the middle school level, at the JV level, dozens and dozens of your former guys who have gone on to coach within this program at East at North. That must mean a great deal to you, you know, to have them want to be back and involved in the place that helps shape a bit of who they are. What does it mean for you to have those alumni back? And, you know, it's the, I believe that's a core part of, a community today is to have, you know, the, the people who lived it and breathed it to come back and be a part of it for the next generation. 
Yeah, I guess um, it kind of goes back to what we talked about earlier. You know, the wrestling gets in your blood. And, um, you know, it's, it's a credit to us that their experience was so good. And the, and the sport is just character building. And, and they realized it. And um, it, it has, you know, not many people win the last match they ever wrestle. Yet they still love it. And, um, you know, it's a credit to the sport and, and the character of the guys that are coaching that, um, you know, they're g- are willing to give up that much time, uh, you know, to, you know, pass the sport on to other kids. And, and we, uh, I mentioned a lot of those, those specific names. And I always ask it, I don't, I try to avoid asking coaches, you know, who's the best wrestler, who's the best football player. It's impossible when you've had hundreds of people that have, you know, been all state, all County champions at many levels, but it's also even more difficult with wrestling because there's so many matches to pick out maybe one or a dual meet or a season. I feel like there's just, you think about one baseball game, it's, you know, a couple of hours, three hours, maybe at, at length. And you can remember that, but when you think about wrestling, do you have like a specific moment? Is there a meet or a match? Is there something so finite where you're like, wow, that was the most special team or Satan wrestling moment. How do you define that? How do you boil that down? It, like you said, it, it's impossible. People are always asking who is the best wrestler you ever had. And we had a number of state champs. We had um, uh, three Olympians, uh, you know, it, and the list, list goes on, the, you know, um, division one NCAA all Americans, division three NCAA all Americans. And people are like, who is the best? And then same thing. What was, what was your most exciting dual meet? What was, what was the most exciting match? And it's, it's impossible. You start thinking about them. And um, sometimes I go on YouTube. It's amazing what's on that. And I'll, I'll punch in like 1992 New York State High School finals. And I'd see John Carvalera. I'd see Jason Kraft, uh, whose finals match was incredible. And he beat a guy that went on to be an NCAA champ. Um, and these are all just a, t- a, ton, of, a ton of different thrills. And um, I guess like in the words of Tom Brady, you know, they ask him, what, which one's your favorite ring? And it'd be the next one. And that's the way we were in wrestling. It was like business as usual. This was great. What a thrill. You know, which most important county championship, the next one. And, and it was a good attitude to have. There's in wrestling, you know, you have the room, the wrestling room, which in, in Sachem's case is named actually in your honor, the Jack Mahoney wrestling room. It's it's really the place where boys become men. It's the place where you build character. It's the place where you could learn a ton about yourself. And I'm saying this as purely somebody who has observed wrestling for over 20 years. I've never was a wrestler, but I respect the hustle and the sacrifice behind wrestling, which may be more than your average sport. I'll never say it's more than another sport, but the the cutting of weight the sacrificing during the holiday season, during that winter stretch with Thanksgiving and Christmas where kids may not be able to eat what they want to, to watch their weight, to work out, to run, to uh, you know wear the sweatsuits, to burn the extra calories. It is just another level of dedication that it, it's a mindset. And I'm sure there are some kids that you've had where they're all in. I'm sure there's a percentage of kids where you've had to cultivate the mindset to make them get all in and make them believe in it. Do you find that a challenge that you always was up for? You know, was it something where if you could turn a kid to believe in himself to meet these sacrifice, these sacrificial elements of team and collaboration and dedication that it would make you say, okay, I did a, I did a good job with this one. Even if he was never a champion, if you could turn their mindset, was that a special challenge that you were always up for? Yeah. And I think um, more than a challenge it was um, a real, a strong feeling of achievement. If you, if you saw some guy, um, some young guy, really become more of a, a man and have be more confident uh, the day he steps out of the wrestling room than the day he stepped in, that um, you know that's really what it's all about. I get you know occasionally get messages from uh, different uh, wrestlers over the years. And the ones that weren't, you know, the most successful or won all the awards, I mean, I, I consider every guy on the team successful. And, um, the, but the one that, um, the guys that didn't really get a lot of the awards, but really worked the hardest, 
it's a big carryover for the rest of their life. So a lot of times they're the guys that we're most proud of as compared to maybe somebody that had tons of God-given talent and used it, but, um, uh, you know, didn't really, you know, have to put out as much in the room and stuff as some of these other kids did. So, um, uh, yeah, we're, we're, I, we, I won't say we're more proud of them, but it's really, I think more about those guys sometimes than I think about guys that went on to win state or even national titles. Uh, at some point in, by the 80s, people started to fear coming to Sachem. People started to teams, programs that couldn't compete, that didn't have the numbers, that weren't as strong. You know, we became uh, the, the arrow was uh, the bullseye was on our back to knock off the top team, you know, as we were one of the top in the state for many years. And did, were you were you and your athletes and assistant coaches aware of that? Were you just functioning on? hey, we're going to be the best and we don't care about what anybody thinks, no matter if they think we're good or bad. Or were you, you know, at a certain point, the mentality was, yeah, we are the best. Come and knock us off. You know, how did you how did you treat that when we were winning in everything? When those same guys were going from winning county championships in football to then winning county championships in wrestling and then doing that in baseball and lacrosse. I mean, it was just it was something else that time period. But how do you how do you keep the kids humble? But and also, you know, give them mindset of we got to win because that's what we do here. It, it was an incredible time period and, and it was a lot of fun, but it was a lot of work. And um, in wrestling, you're given a lease schedule. And in those days, um, uh, we were only allowed like, your lease schedule might have seven matches on it. We were allowed maybe 11 duels, 12 duels, two or three tournaments, and that was your whole season, um, which was good in a way because you had more practice time. But um, once we went look, we'd want to go looking for non-league matches, we'd have a hard time finding them. So we'd be going upstate to suffer in New York and wrestling, you know, um, suffer in Monroe, Woodbury, Fulton would come down. Um, you know, we'd have to hunt around to get first people that would agree to wrestle us, but we would always look for the toughest competition. We weren't uh, looking to go undefeated. We were just looking to wrestle the best people. Um, and, and uh, you know, it, it paid off. Then by the end of the year, our kids were more ready for the big tournaments. Uh, how, how about the, the, your legacy? How would you like to be remembered when people talk about Jack Mahoney and Sachem Wrestling or when they walk in that Jack Mahoney wrestling room? You know, what, what is the impression that you want people to uh, verbalize and think about you as a coach, a man, an educator? Um. Well, I had given this some thought and talked about it. Me and Isaac talk about this a lot, but basically Sage Wrestling has been very successful, but people have to keep in mind that I did not ever score one takedown, one near fall, one pin. It, it was all the wrestlers and behind the wrestlers were their parents and behind the parents and everybody else were the middle school coaches and my assistant coaches. So, my legacy is not really with me, but it's all the people that were around me that bought in on something that I was passionate about and they really made it happen. Uh, without them, Sachem, we wouldn't be having this discussion right now. So it's, it's not about me. It's, you know, I mean, it's nice that the community thought enough to name the wrestling room after me, but that's why it says alumni wrestling room because all the other people that went into it that should really be getting the credit. So every award that I get, there should be thousands of people standing up there when they hand us the plaque because it's theirs more than mine. National Wrestling Hall of Famer, Suffolk Hall of Famer, Sachem Hall of Famer, Lindenhurst Hall of Famer, one of the best to ever do it. And you did impact the lives of thousands of student athletes and beyond, even in your physical education world as well. So thanks on behalf of this entire community for everything you've done. I, you, you reminded me before this, you, the first time we spoke was when I was in high school in an interview, which I, I, thousands of interviews later, I actually forgot, but now I can remember sitting in that room where Isaac Ramaswamy was that my teacher at that time. So for 20 years, I've been talking to you about your legacy and the things that you've done for this community, but I agree. It's about the program. It's about the people that you've touched and the lives that you've impacted and for that, we're all grateful, and I appreciate this conversation, Coach. Well, I appreciate you uh, inviting me in today. This was this was a lot of fun, and uh, 
you know, it's, um, you got quite a long, long line of great coaches to interview. Yeah. One at a time. We're getting the stories. We're documenting the history and that's the whole purpose. And I'm excited about it. So thank you. Oh, thank you.